Right, we're looking now at reducing inflammation and pain in endometriosis. One in ten women you may see in your lifetime. So, what is pain? It's an important alarm signal, described as the guardian of health. It can be an unpleasant, achy feeling, or it can be excruciating, debilitating pain that painkillers don't even touch. When I'm describing endo pain, I tell the gynecologist that if I was to tie them in a chair at the uh, Royal Albert Hall and cut a lid off their stomach and pour concentrated sulfuric acid inside it and put Nigel Kennedy on the stage playing one note of his violin for the next eight hours, they might guess what the pain is like. It's terrifying. But pain is what the patient says it is because all our levels of pain are different. And it exists when he says it does. And when we can assess the patient's pain accurately, we can treat it effectively. So you have to give them the words. Paul Dimrowski and Dan Martin wrote up a chart of words which I use with patients so that they can say whether it's stabbing, burning, lacerating, twisting, ringing. What sort of pain is it? Um, I was in so much pain I could not speak, yet inside I was screaming. That was me, head in the mattress, trying not to breathe. Graham sitting in a corner of the bedroom crying because he couldn't even touch me. I couldn't even bear his hand on my shoulder. So acute pain is the body's alarming, intense sensation. The purpose is to stop us from further injuring ourselves. But in endometriosis, we're not injured. We're injured abdominally with deep infiltrating adhesions. So pain can stem from malfunction in the body circuits. It might be you're short of an, an enzyme because you're short of a nutrient that works the pain signal. And it's misbehavior of nerves themselves. And the drugs target only neurons. So the underlying source of the pain can be dysfunction if you've got non-neural cells that are called glia in the brain and spinal cord that aren't responding to the drugs. An ectopic endometrium activates the glia cells through inflammatory responses of cytokines and the chemokines that are produced and increased with COX-2 and prostaglandin series 2. And glia are these neurotransmitters that enhance and modulate these neuronal signals. And when they're injured, they release growth factors that call on the immune system to fight infection and initiate healing. And they've got these mechanisms for detecting electrical activity. I always remember when I was writing my book and I put in that we were um, magnetic and electrical. My copy editor wanted to take it out and said, no, we're not. And I had to fight and say, yes, we are. Um, so channels for sensing potassium and other ions released by the neurons that are firing these electrical impulses and surface receptors that sense the neurotransmitters that the neurons used to communicate across the synapse. And it's all happening in the blink of an eye. I always think of cuttlefish. When you see cuttlefish in the sea and they're flashing different colors down their skin, it's fascinating. And that's what's happening in us. So arachidonic acid from meat and dairy make type 2 prostaglandin, the PGE2 and the leukotrienes. But our body cells also produce them in their own right. And people are given non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to reduce that inflammation. And the COX-1, which the non-steroidals dampen down, actually help protect the gut by promoting mucus, which protects the membrane and supports the kidneys and normal blood clotting. But it's the COX-2 which is bad. So if you had a tablet that just hit on COX-2, it wouldn't be so bad, but it's sitting on COX-1 as well. And the COX-2, you get these burning sensations from the prostaglandin. And the aspirin and ibuprofen are targeting both. It's a shame, really. And you've got a 
growth in COX-2 use in patients with minimal risk of suffering gastrointestinal bleeding. So, like, you know, doctor tells you to take these things, you start taking them, and then you start bleeding from your bowel on top of what you've already got. <laughs> it's not much fun. So, prostaglandins, they're traces of fat stored in cell membranes. They promote inflammation, muscle contractions. So the womb's cramping, the bowel muscles are cramping, the blood vessels are constricted, you've got blood clotting and pain. You've got these constricted blood vessels in the uterus, so the muscle layers cramping like nine pins. And the concentration in the blood is high as well. So the blood, the peritoneal fluid, everything's full of these blessed burning chemicals. And they enter the bloodstream, so you get headaches, you get teenage girls with diarrhea, vomiting, passing out from period pain, and it's all to do with the prostaglandins being produced by the endometrial implants. And series 2 arachidonic is the most pro-inflammatory, because people don't eat nuts and seeds and oily fish like they used to anymore, they're not taking in the good oils that would balance the bad oils and they're taking in lots of trans fats. So we've got to try and persuade them to eat the right food. Research shows that certain chemicals, these cytokines, that are produced by macrophages as they're going round trying to remove the endometrial implants as they would with cancer, are implicated in cell proliferation and inflammation reactions. So you've got the volume of the peritoneal fluid and its content of these inflammatory cells called macrophages, like Pac-Men going around gobbling up detritus that shouldn't be there, have been shown to be significantly increased in patients with endometriosis, particularly in mild forms of the disease. Because you often find women with type 1 and type 2 endometriosis have more pain than women with type 3 and 4. So you've got all these chemicals producing this inflammation. So control of inflammatory gene expression and control of the production of the inflammatory cytokines, which are like interleukine-6, chemokines, eicosanoids, leukotriene B4, prostaglandin, PGE2, and all these inflammatory proteins cause high sensitivity on the tissue. And you can measure this in your patients with C-reactive protein and see if they've got an inflammatory marker in their blood. And then you can take steps to reduce it. So the arachidonic acid, if you give steroid drugs, it will reduce pain and swelling. If you give the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, you can reduce the pain but increase blood clotting and reduce the pain but the gut's damaged. So in no way, shape or form, you're triggering another problem unless you put diet in with it. So the non-steroidal, as I've said before, deplete folic acid and iron. You need to get one of these books. I can't live without it, really. Drug-Induced Nutrient Depletion Handbook by Lexi Comp. I mean, they're just marvelous. They go through every drug and what deficiencies it causes. And I wouldn't be without it. It's just a little book you can carry around with you. Or it was. Um, aspirin, folic acid, iron, potassium, sodium. And I mean, they give that to women during IVF to thin their blood. But they're not putting back the nutrients that it's taking out. And the research says that if, you're giving food, if they're eating foods high in salacity, salicylates, it compounds the problem. And the pill again, vitamin C, B12, folic acid, magnesium, B6, B2, zinc. So we've got all these problems. Amitriptyline they give to women with endo to try and, at low doses, 10 milligrams, to try and stop the nerve pain. But that depletes B2 and CoQ10. The estrogens, again, magnesium, B6, zinc. So we've got to try and add back, like Yasmin have actually done, to get the nutrient imbalance corrected. And I've mentioned luteinizing and ruptured follicle with non-steroidals. Um, the stimulus for growth of endo is estrogen. 
And of course, you can just believe that the patches, these particular patches I showed you of endometriosis, actually produce their own estrogen. They're producing PGE2, especially the red patches. It goes from yellow, orange, red, brown, black. And the black patches are when it's dying off. But the red patches produce estrogen and the prostaglandins. So when they're at the most active, apart from eating estrogen in your diet and having it in the pesticides, these blessed patches are producing extra. Um, so we know that chicken fat, fish fat, beef fat, wheat, soya, citrus fruits, olive oil, cannula oils, linseed oil, drive estrogen levels up. So we've got to try and get some balance in with the green veg to bring it down, like the brassicas. And women, if they're eating a Western diet, but they reduce their saturated fat intake by half, the estrogen level's 20% lower. And this is Mary Lou's American research with 4,000 cases. But period pain, 95% of the women. Fatigue, 87%. I rang up the, um, you know, what do you call it? Chronic fatigue syndrome, ME. ME people, because I thought I'd got that as well, because it, the fatigue is just phenomenal. You're sort of crawling on the floor. It's horrendous. Diarrhea or constipation when you're having a period. Abdominal bloating, it's like you're nine months pregnant. And when it's really bad, you feel as though your bowels are going to burst open. You, it sounds like a witch's cauldron of bubbling blub, blub, blub. Everything's fermenting in your gut, and it felt like it was trying to go through an egg timer, as though there was a constriction. It's just horrendous. Irregular heavy bleeding, dyspareunia, painful intercourse, nausea at menstruation, or projectile vomiting, some women are doing, dizziness, headaches with their period, low resistance to infection because your progesterone's not working properly, your immune system's weaker, so you're actually catching every bug going. Um, infertility and then low-grade fevers, although I always felt cold. And a lot of the women, their body temperature is around 36, not 37. So what are the causes? We don't honestly know. Retrograde menstrual blood percolating out of fallopian tubes. Malarian cell rest, so that as you're a fetus, some of the female cells start growing in the wrong places. Immune system failure, salomic metaplasia, the endometrial cells are carried around in the lymphatic system. So that's why some women get it in their lung or their eye or their gums or their ankles or their heart. Um, viral infection effect. Albert Singer always says we're going to find it's a virus. Um, failure of the endometrium. Well, certainly we've got that. Failure of epithelial tissue. It's not behaving as it should. Um, Hans Evers in the Netherlands, he says that women with endometriosis, their epithelial tissue is like Velcro, whereas other women without endometriosis, their epithelial tissue is like Teflon. It sloughs off. It doesn't take hold. So, but it's going to be multifactorial. This is like a spider's web. It's not going to be one thing. It's going to be several things. And we don't really know the exact trigger. So women with endometriosis get abdominal pain, dysmenorrhea, heavy bleeding, pain at ovulation, bowel, bladder pain. 30% of women have got endometriosis on the bladder. And I had one woman who had a growth of endometriosis the size of a grapefruit removed from within her bladder, a bowel rather. Um, so the lesions cause this chronic pain syndrome, but not in everybody. Some women are opened up when they're being sterilized and they've got a lump of endometriosis the size of a five-month fetus and they've never had any pain in their life. And we don't understand why. Some people get pain, some don't. I wonder if it's because some, their digestion's working, they're taking in the nutrients, their pain pathways work, and the rest of us 
we're not taking in the nutrients and our pain pathways are not working. Who knows? Watch this spot. But pain and inflammation have their origin in a vitamin deficiency and are at best treated with that particular vitamin. We know vitamin C deficiency with scurvy, bleeding gums, tender joints, and considerable pain. So what do we know with the other vitamins? <clears throat> and I started doing the research looking at which vitamins and minerals are needed for pain. And it's vitamin C, E, K, zinc and selenium, essential fatty acids, B1, B6, B12, magnesium and DL, phenylalanine. So those are all the nutrients that come up for pain. And research showed that with period pain, in the absence of endometriosis, I've read this through earlier, didn't I? The small trial showed fish oil was more effective than a placebo for pain relief. And limited evidence shows that B1 and B6 are beneficial, and the use of magnesium shows less menstrual cramps. So we have to advise the women that they should be eating more nutrient-dense inflammatory, anti-inflammatory foods Calories, in this case, don't matter. It's getting the nutrients in that your bodies need, which is the important key. And there are these theories of pain, the gait control theory, sensory dis discriminative, motivational affective, cognitive evaluative. And they say that there are large diameter a beta nerve fibers which inhibit pain transmission, close the gate, and prevent the pain. But the small diameter, A delta and C nerve fibers, facilitate the transmission of pain, open the gate so you feel pain. So a higher level gate, a reticular limbic structure in the brain, the old part of the brain, then you get it mediating the drive to escape unpleasant stimuli. So if your hand's burning, you move it away from the oven. But with endo, you can't move anywhere. You're stuck. Um, Lowe's the Seattle pain model. This is nociception. So the neurological signal generated by the tissue damage, which if you've got deep infiltrating endometriosis, you've got a problem because you've got derangement of normal bodily function. So you've got this perception of pain and the neurological reaction in the brain to pain. You suffer and you've got pain behavior, you roll up in a ball, you do what I call the hurt animal syndrome. You can't cope with the world outside and you go and curl up in a corner until you feel better. It's dreadful and we've got too many young girls with this. So pain control, inhibit it, limit it, block it, dull it, control it. This is from Michael Murray and Pizzorno. And inflammation, this adaptive response, triggered by noxious stimuli. So it could be pesticides, chemicals on your skin, cause a rash and a sore. But in our case, it's the womb lining tissue growing into the other tissue. And you get this cacophony of signals. And it sometimes seems that we're more concerned in hospitals about minimizing the patient's expression of pain than getting rid of the pain itself. It's just give them a tablet, quieten it down, but we don't know what's causing it, but if we keep giving the painkillers. So we've got to find the causes. So we've got injury, infection, allergy, autoimmune problems, obesity, triggering inflammation, which is all leading to weak immunity and symptoms, flu-like fatigue, aches, burning. So we've got to try and find out how we turn off the inflammation. Is it the primary cause of disease development or is the inflammation a secondary adaptive response to disturbances in cellular physiology and that activates the pain? But you've got, what is inflammation? It's rubber, redness, calor, the heat, duller, the pain, and tumor, the swelling. You've got different modalities triggering the inflammation. An environmental exposure to a number of xenobiotics, including pesticides, can have serious effects on the immune system of children, rendering them susceptible to infections and other disease states. 
Elevations in pro-inflammatory cytokines, neuropeptides, indicate a state of generalized and neurogenic inflammation. When I was seven, Sellafield, which was wind scale, blew up, and I was in the cloud for that. And when I was eight, a factory producing dioxins at Clay Cross in Derbyshire blew up, and I was in the cloud for that. So there's a lot of research looking at pesticides and all these problems, radiation. So, a problem. So, in triggers for inflammation, toxicity, infections, allergies, nutrient excess or nutrient deficiency, injury, emotional trauma. So, any of those can trigger your body into starting an inflammatory situation. And inflammation is this assault to the membrane. The immune system responds with the macrophages. They dump bleach, which goes into the fluid, and we get this big cascade as the body's trying to heal itself, but causing inflammation and nothing switching it off. And sometimes with endometriosis, I do think that the body learns the pain and even after you start getting well, that pain pathway has still got hold of you and it won't let go. And you have to learn relaxation techniques and other things to try and help you out of it. So it's a natural defense. It's your body's natural defense to stop harm, really. And under normal healthy conditions, it protects you. But if we're eating a low diet, like these teenagers on their pizza, pasta, crisps, chips, chocolate, coke, and coffee, where are you? You've not got anything to help you. You're not taking anything in to help you. So the inflammatory response will go wrong. So the sugar, the radiation, the trans fats, it leads to this NF-kappa B cascade. And that's an intracellular amplifier like a big horn, if you like, increasing production of mediators of inflammation, all these nasty chemicals. And I love this piece of research, 2004, American Journal of Nutrition, given a single meal of eggs, sausage muffin, and two hash browns. Isn't that a lovely meal? Wouldn't you like that? But what did it do? The documented increase in NF-kappa B after the meal was 150%. I wish we did more of this sort of research. Um, so they tested with this C-reactive protein marker before and after the research to see what happened. So we could all do that. If we take our patients into the Big Brother house and get them healthy and then give them a meal of hash browns and beef burgers, and then test their um, NF-kappa B and their C-reactive protein. Wouldn't that be fun? So endometrial implants and cysts produce cytokines. We've said that. The IL-6 proteins and the peritoneal fluid we know has got all these PGE2 in. And it, it's just building up all the inflammation and harming fertility. And with vitamin D deficiency, you've got associations of pain, inflammation, autoimmunity, rheumatoid arthritis. If you supplement with vitamin D, you reduce inflammatory IL-6 cytokines and C-reactive protein and NF-kappa B. Isn't that amazing? And you've got the metalloproteinases, which depend on zinc. So giving zinc helps bring down the inflammation. But I do worry about vitamin D because Martin Hum, who edits the Ion magazine, he says Rentakill always have used high doses of vitamin D as a rat killer. So I think we have to be a bit careful how we use vitamin D and not use too high a dose, but a, a moderate dose, because that, that would worry me. And also, you get calcium deposits in soft organ tissues if your vitamin D level's too high. So we've got to find what is correct. 
Um, metabolic syndrome, evolutionary processes result in remarkable relationships between humans and the bioactive component in their food. Many phytochemicals, not the vitamins and minerals, but the phytochemicals, are secondary metabolites in plants and produce this anti-stress compound for the plant if it's being nibbled or eaten away. And the compounds are now being found to be bioactive sub substances that help reduce inflammation in humankind. From the meeting I had with the Secretary of State for Health, 45% of the British population never cook. This came from the Sure Start project. The people live on convenience foods. And they showed that 40% of the mothers had, in the Sure Start groups had never cooked one meal for their child. The children were living on packed food. And the thing that makes you want a sick bag is that some mothers were giving liquidized leftover Chinese and Indian takeaways to their babies the next morning. That's what we're up again. 84% of women weren't having folic acid. 74% didn't have enough nutrients from the diet. 8% decrease in omega-3 fatty acids. We need our herrings back again. 50% more saturated fats are eaten than are recommended. And 15% of women, 13% of men are eating one or two veg a day if you're lucky on a pizza or chopped up in their pasta. Wouldn't we all love if the hospitals tested all their patients for vitamin and mineral defect deficiencies like this. Iron deficiency, 40%. B12, 48%. Folate, 54 to 64. It's nearly half of the people are low on all these vitamins and minerals. Zinc, 40 to 50%. It's just amazing. And we know that the colon gut flora make K, thiamine, riboflavin, nicotinic acid, pyridoxin, biotin, folic acid, B12. So we've got to try and get these women having healthy gut flora. Remember the women I've seen have been on hormones for about eight years and painkillers forever. And their gut flora is probably curled up in a heap somewhere. So we've got intestinal permeability often. They're on anti-inflammatory drugs. Their liver's creaking at the gates. There's this inflammation going. They're eating rubbish or they're eating well. Some of them I could send to eat with Prince Charles at Highgrove, but they wouldn't get better because their gut is so compromised. They can't absorb properly and we've got pathogens. So you've got this commensal bacteria in your gut, 10 to the 14, pyro, I can never say this, prokaryotic organisms that make up your gut flora like two pounds, two bags, four pounds of sugar in your gut. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And they block NF-kappa B and TNF-alpha. So we've got, if your gut flora is healthy, it helps reduce inflammation. The probiotic effects have been associated with amelioration of mucosal inflammation and a variety of animal models of inflammatory bowel disease shown to modify inflammatory responses distant from the gut, in the liver, in the synovium, in the knee and potentially in the brain. So if your gut flora is healthy, it's helping reduce inflammation throughout the body. And we've got this one single, I can't get this to work again. Oh yes. A single commensal bacterium induces regulatory T cells in vivo, which protect the host from pathogen-induced inflammatory responses, limiting activation of the pro-inflammatory NF, Kappa B, and the toll light reflectors. So we know that all of this is so crucial to get gut flora healthy as well as everything else. We've got to keep these enteric bacteria happy. That is the key. We've got this hygiene hypothesis. When you were two years old and 
one year old and you were crawling in the soil and eating the worms, then your immune system was building up a response. But if your mummy didn't let you crawl in the soil and eat the worms, your immune system doesn't work as well as it should. So we've got this dysregulation of the immune system, recognizing cereals from the trillions of human microflora in order to shape or destroy the human tolerance of the immune system. I try to use glutamine with the uh, permatrol and acidophilus because that helps feed the gut membrane so it can heal. And slippery elm helps reduce inflammation throughout the digestive tract. The Cochrane review on probiotics showed it was effective against reducing diarrhea. The 2005 report looked at 105 studies and said that it was helpful to treat 68 different conditions. And in the Bible, Abraham said that he owed his fertility and longevity to eating yogurt. And fermented dairy has been used since the third millennium BC. And we have microflora in the intestine and going through all the nutrients, but also it's producing l arginine, cysteine, glutamine, and other nutrients. So we've got to keep this gut flora happy. There's a big research with billions of dollars going on in Chicago because they've actually realized there's money to be made in this. So bioacidophilus, the basic bioacidophilus is 20 billion cells. The bioacidophilus forte is 30 billion. The bioacidophilus forte plus has got lactobacillus salvarius in it, and that's very strong at 75 billion. There's permatrol with the glutamine at 1 billion. The cranberry plus acidophilus is 630 million, and calcidophilus 630 million. And I can't find what's in the GI complex. It's not in the new book. But those are the products that, they, that are produced by Biocare that help gut flora. When I'm taking women in at first, they cannot tolerate things with fossin. It bloats them. So I start with the things without fossin. So supplemental studies with omega-3 oils, the EPA, DHEA, demonstrate they reduce inflammatory pathways. They've got potent biological activities, the homeostasis functions, and regulate blood vessel leaping, leaking, lipid accumulation and inflammation and immune cell behavior. And omega-3 fats also are reducing inflammation because they're also working on kinase signaling pathways. So it's not just reducing inflammation per se. They're helping the gene expression as well. Omega-6, as Ellen was saying, I never use omega-3 without omega-6. I try and get a balance because you're working down two inflammatory pathways. If you take out omega-6 and only use omega-3, you're only using one anti-inflammatory pathway. So I use low doses of omega-6 sometimes to reduce inflammation. The borage oil, evening primrose and hemp and black currant oils, it reduces swelling and tenderness, reduces morning stiffness and pain reduction. So I do use some of it, but sparingly. In a group of Danish women, a higher intake of omega-3 fatty acids or a higher intake of omega-3 balanced with omega-6 was associated with reduced menstrual pain. So reducing prostaglandins, the green leafy veg, the legumes, the fish, walnuts, linseed, hemp oils, so long as we know they're not pesticided. And I just threw this in because I like this one. Researchers observed that the more linoleic acid in the fat tissue, the less obese the person. So that must hold for something significant if there's a family history of obesity. And soluble fiber, we need people having whole grains like oats, vegetables, beans, plant foods that keep the estrogen down naturally. You'll notice some of my slides when I lecture in America. I've got the American spelling. I haven't forgotten the O on the front. 
Um, so Georgetown University Medical Center used diet modification in 19 women with moderate to severe period pain. They avoided animal fats for two months, focused on unprocessed foods, rice, whole grains, beans, vegetables, fruits. So a sort of vegetarian type diet. And they all needed much less pain medication than before. So soluble fiber with inulin, pectinin, mucilagin breaks down in water and works through the gut easily. The ground flax seeds, the amaranth, teff, the gluten-free, wheat-free oats with avenin in helps to soak up the cholesterol and the estrogens and regulate the cholesterol and hormones. But the insoluble fiber, the wheat bran, the skin of beans and seeds that don't dissolve can trigger ileocecal valve syndrome in some people. Vitamin A, there's research in South Africa showing that vitamin A deficiency, you get more period pain, and it helps the immune system after major surgery when you've been on the operating table for eight hours. So lots of red, orange, green fruits yellow fruits. Vitamin C is a natural antihistamine, reducing histamine attacks from internal inflammation. So all your fresh fruit and vegetables, so long as it's not been a, in a chill warehouse for 18 months. Vitamin E slowly limits inflammation if taken regularly. Analgesic effect because it inhibits pro-inflammatory PGE2, and 300 IUs a day reduce muscle cramps and pains in the lower back, so seeds, olive oil, green veg, avocados, salmon, eggs. Vitamin K should be made by healthy gut flora, and it's in lots of dark green leafy things, but that again produces significant inhibition of inflammation and pain. So trying to make sure that we've got enough vitamin K. B vitamins, as I said earlier, filter from the bloodstream by the liver via the bile duct and into the gut, into the intestinal tract. And if the diet's low in B vitamins, the amount of estrogen in the blood will rise. So people must eat their greens, as their granny said, to get their B vitamins in. Grandma was right. So high doses of vitamin B1, the thiamine, I find this research, I wish somebody would repeat this research, suppresses pain transmission. There's some relationship between thiamine and morphine. This is 1977. Morphine was significantly increased by the amount of thiamine in the cortical hemisphere by 21%, etc. So high doses of B1 are reported to produce ganglion blockades to suppress the transmission of pain. And they gave this intravenously. But when you look at the research on women short of B1, it's 22.8% of, what was it, 6,400 adult women tested. So it's a, fine, you know, a high level. You're talking about a fifth of all women are low. And thiamine's need for ovarian hormone production and a deficiency inhibits ovulation. So in reproductive factors, it's important. B6 increases resistance to pain, especially when they've overused pain medication and it's in carpal tunnel syndrome. Reduces depression and irritability. So lots of foods to get people tucking into. Beans, potatoes, spinach, sweet potato. And another piece of old research from 1964, when B12 is taken with B1 and B6, it produces significant dose dependence pain and inhibits inflammation, comparable to standard treatments in orthodox medicine. So we need to repeat these sorts of research and show that this is important. I often get young women with no B12 because they've been taking painkillers for so long their gut flora is so disrupted, they're not producing intrinsic factor. Calcium, 
33% were given 1,000 milligrams a day to reduce menstrual pain and premenstrual syndrome. But like copper, calcium is estrogenic, so you wouldn't want to give it too much without balancing it like copper with zinc and calcium with magnesium. So women with normal menstrual cycles and mild menstrual symptoms were given calcium and manganese, and that helped to produce, reduce the menstrual pain and the fluid retention. So that was an important thing, but you need to balance it with other nutrients. Magnesium and pain reduction, useful in chronic fatigue syndrome, improving energy because it works in the Krebs cycle, and reduce pain in 80% of subjects when used orally for six weeks or injected. And again, foods, nuts and seeds, raisins, green peas, jacket potatoes. Apparently, we're eating far less green peas because children eat with their fingers. They don't use knives and forks. So peas are going out of vogue because you don't know how to eat them anymore. Um, magnesium, numerous reports, women with PMS have got low levels. So giving it, it's needed for carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism. It's needed for production of ATP, transfer of energy, contractibility of muscles. So people do need their magnesium. And it's, as Ellen was saying, test red cell magnesium. It's often very low. And you can test white cell zinc. Um, 50 patients from primary dysmenorrhea were treated with magnesium. Six months, 21 out of 25 women had a decline in symptoms. So again, another piece of research using magnesium. Primary dysmenorrhea, no, this is another one. They're all <laughs> clicking on that one and that one. It's confusing me. Um, primary dysmenorrhea is characterized by painful syndromes on the first and second day of the cycle, if only it was the first and second day only. And they used a magnesium card, whatever that was, for six cycles and 21 patients. 11 had been treated with magnesium, 10 with a placebo, and it reduced lower back pain and lower abdominal pain on day two and three of the cycle. So investigate it further. So we've got biomagnesium, which I always use if someone's got nervous symptoms and poor adrenal response. Magnesium taurate if they've got very high estrogen levels. Magnesium malate for energy and relaxing smooth muscle in the gut and the uterus. Magnesium EAP2, I use that if they've got palpitations. And magnesium with B5 if they've got poor adrenal response or if they're grinding their teeth at night. And zinc is known to be anti-inflammatory. 12-week research, giving them zinc sulfate, they had um, reduced inflammation. So it inhibits histamine and leukotriene release from mast cells and dampens down inflammation. It's necessary for DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. It helps wound healing. If you remember, I said um, Guy's Hospital in St. Bart's are actually using vitamin C and zinc to get their beds back faster. So lean meat, liver, eggs, seafood, nuts, and seeds. Selenium, piece of research again, 1974 and 1963, that says it's anti-inflammatory enhances immune response. But the Lancet in 2000 said how important it was for structural and enzyme roles. It's needed for immune system function, for counteracting HIV and AIDS, sperm motility, reducing miscarriage, adverse mood states, cardiovascular risk. So they really are beginning to look at what's happening with nutrients, thank goodness. Um, markers oxidative stress in infertile women and women with endo and controls. So oxidative stress is implicated in pathogenesis. So we think that the oxidative stress is damaging the epithelial tissue so that the endometriosis can take hold and grow in it. So 
there is a positive association between advanced endometriosis stage and the increased serum levels of hyperperoxidases, suggesting an increased production of reactive species in women, particularly with type 3 and stage 3 and stage 4. And they had decreased levels of glutathione. So obviously selenium is in, important. So you've got the antioxidant complex, the curcumin. There is some research on turmeric. The Nutrigard Forte and Cellgard Forte, but you can't give those if they're trying to get pregnant because there's too much vitamin A and Vitaflavin as well. So food allergies, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays and advanced cell tests. People had reduced pain when food allergens were removed from their diet. Their tenderness and stiffness and fatigue diminished and their moods improved, their bowel symptoms improved. And MSG, caffeine, food colorings, chocolate, shrimps, and dairy products were the worst offenders. Harvard looked, Stacy and her co-workers looked at women who'd had two or more cups of caffeinated coffee, like four cans of cola a day, were twice as likely to develop endometriosis as other women. And some German research found that women with high blood levels of PCBs in plastics and pesticides had a higher level of endometriosis. So these pesticides, I'm talking about food, but the food contains some of these pesticides, which then weaken the immune system. So that can struggle to remove the endometriotic implants if it's weakened. So the natural killer cells and all the cytokines and macrophages that are supposed to be removing the endo cells that are growing in the wrong place don't function properly. And PCBs are in chicken, fish, cattle, pigs, animals that have been fed grains contaminated with organochlorines. And please don't get me onto GM food and cows kept in sheds with eight and a half thousand cows fed on genetically modified soya beans and cereals. It's just beyond belief. Um, dietary supplements with fish oils. This was where I actually first started. This was the first piece of research I found where they'd actually sewn endometriotic implants into bunny rabbits and then fed them fish oils and watched the implant shrink away. So what we've got to try and get people to do is have this Mediterranean diet like Italy, Crete, and Greece, which is harder here because for nectarines and peaches are far more expensive than if you were buying a huge kilo of them in southern Italy. But trying to get people to eat more plant foods, trying to get them to do a one-stock pot with lots of vegetables in it. Do they like it? Maybe they won't eat it. But we should be trying to get them to have some vegetable soups and broths and stews and casseroles. So all the nutrients are in the gravy, not being washed down the sink. Desserts, fresh fruit and small amounts of goats or sheep's cheese. Main protein, shellfish, whitefish, oily fish, poultry, lamb, goat, maybe venison, duck, and extra virgin olive oil, and maybe here some organic butter, but little bits. Red meat, pork, and beef are rarely eaten, but they eat some lamb, which has been grazed on pasture. Wine in small amounts with their main meal, not having a bottle every evening just because. And sweeteners, local honey. And wines, all the foods coming from a local farm. And they're working hard. You know, they're not sitting at a desk. So try and get people to go out for a walk at lunchtime, we've said. So 68 women on a Mediterranean diet with diagnosed endometriosis over five months. They had significant reduction of period pain, painful intercourse, and painful bowel movements. So that was a start. 
And women who had the highest fifth of omega-3 fatty acid consumption were 20% less likely to be diagnosed with endo compared with the lower fifth of intake. So there's obviously something going on. This was the nurse's study, a 20-year follow-up of 85,000 women. And it showed that there was a 30% less cardiovascular disease and stroke. Olives, we need people having olives. Potent anti-inflammatory painkillers, reducing TNF-alpha and interleukine-6. So studies on olive oil show that it helps reduce inflammation. Walnuts, omega-3 fatty acids, are the only nut that seems to have lots of omega-3 in. So if they have a handful of nuts every day with some walnuts in it, it will help reduce inflammation. Wild game, shellfish and fish. When you look at the old diets, you find that there is definitely a difference in the sort of storage fat in wild animals compared to domestic animals. So trying to get people to eat wild meat like they did in Paleolithic times. This is research showing what we ate. It's so different to what we eat now, but it was all pasture-fed meat, and we had gr very few grains till we s started growing crops, but legumes we ate and fruit and veg. So we've got to use the proanthocyanidins in the berries, the procyanidins, and increased vitamin C levels in cells, it reduces inflammation, the berries, the grape seed, the pine bark extract, and red wine. But you'd need 16 bottles of red wine a day to have the same effect as a tablet. So the pine bark extract was done with endometriosis and reduced inflammation and pain. So you can read through that one. Um, we need to look at what we're eating. I mean, we've got 9 billion people. Not everybody's going to get wild game. But we need to look at where we're buying our food from. Has it been laced with chemicals? You know, what condition is the soil in? Is it being, are the plants being fed by good soil? I was saying earlier that Craig Sands grew up in Nebraska, the green and blacks chap. And they had eight meters of topsoil in the 1930s. And now it's down to 18 inches of topsoil. It's washing away. So Gordon Hillman's research in Turkey, he showed that we cooked half a million years ago. We were eating 3,000 3, plant species, which after the ice age, the younger Dryas in 11... Thousand BC was reduced to 80 to 150 seeds and goat, sheep and lower antioxidant intake. So I've put you a list of foods that people need to eat to reduce inflammation. So the berries, the seeds, the eggs, the garlic, the herrings, the kippers, the red onions, all of those. And foods that fight infection, you can read through garlic and ginger, which thin your blood, so improve blood supply to the ovaries. The papaya for digestive enzymes helps it fight infection. Sesame seeds, pumpkin squash, mushrooms. These rainbow meals, try and get your patients to understand that their food should be multicolored, not cauliflower, cheese, mashed potato colored. And I've got a lovely cartoon, which is two men sitting in a bed. And one says, you know, I think the barium meal was nicer than the cauliflower cheese. <laughs> so food, glorious food. It is really, if only people would start eating properly. So your fish, your meat, your eggs, your fruit, your veg, your pulses, the gourds, nuts and seeds, and I try and get most people on non-gluten grains, rice, corn, millet, buckwheat, and tubers like tapioca, arrowroot, chufa. Turmeric is a good one, the curcumin, to reduce inflammation without side effects of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And of course, although we're talking nutrition, we've got to get people to exercise because that decreases your estrogen levels. 
So trying to get people to do something. But when you're in agony and every step is pain, it's difficult. But they did look at patients with chronic fatigue and they started them off what I call a slow shoe shuffle for 5 or 15 minutes walking 5 days a week just round the avenue and back and that helped because it also massages the gut and I talked to you earlier about the blue zone you must read this book Costa Rica, Okinawa, Sardinia, Loma Linda where they're living to their hundreds and it's lifestyle and diet and it's very important snacking is a hassle they don't have Mars bars on every corner shop. Drinking fresh water, that's the next problem we're going to have, finding fresh water as it all becomes contaminated. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. So do not ask why pain, only what has to be done with it, and let humanity be our goal. So encouraging people to eat healthy food. We knew this, 50 AD, they had 500 food remedies. 400 BC, they had 3,000 healing foods. And the NAPRA alert database shows that 25% of all prescriptive drugs in the world are derived from natural plant sources that correlate exactly with what the folk remedies said they did. Ha. Huh. So pain can be terrifying, and we need not just orthodox, we need complementary therapies and diet. And what matters most is whether your patient is comfortable and the pain is reducing. Pain is different for everybody. And all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. You get shot and your head's taken off. Then it's opposed, oh, what rubbish. And then somebody says, oh, perhaps there is something in that anyway. So that's where we go. My book is Endometriosis, A Key to Healing and Fertility Through Nutrition. I've got a new book coming out next year with Random House. I've got a booklet on all the nutrition and fertility with a DVD of eight women who've got better and pregnant and had babies with nutrition that talk to my patients and tell them how they did it. So I hope that my two hours of exhausting lecturing <laughs> have helped you all. Thank you.